Hi guys, I hope you're well. I wanted to go over an email that I received from Simon Black. Not really directly, but I'm on his email list. <laughs> and he, I tell you what, I'm on a couple, maybe four or five email lists. I don't really read them too much, but his is one that I read probably 50% of the time. I would strongly suggest uh, signing up for his free email list at SovereignMan.com. He really, uh, I don't know if he writes them or if he has someone else writing them, but wh whoever writes them does a very good job. So anyway, I wanted to go over the uh, the email here and just not necessarily word for word, but just kind of go over the outline version of it because I, I think we need to start considering the ramifications of them uh, rolling this out in the United States. And, uh, you know, Dakota Diesel is just saying, George, New York just mandated the vaccines to enter restaurant, gym, and entertainment. So we on this channel, you know, as rebel capitalists, if you will, we understand that the future is trending towards more central planning and potentially totalitarianism, more uh, micromanaging of our daily lives. This is, it's not, uh, I don't think it's anything insightful to say that we are, as a society, the West in general is trending in this direction. So uh, one of the things that I think they will most likely roll out <laughs> is a uh, social credit score. I hope not. I hope not. And there are no certainties. There are only probabilities. But I think the probability is high that we go this direction. And uh, so let's check out this email from Sovereign Man. And let's see if I can zoom in here. Here we go. All right. As a journalist in China, Li Hu was no stranger to punishment for reporting on corrupt governments, etc. You'd always be fined. Uh, but then suddenly in 2017, he found he was unable to buy a plane ticket. The system just rejected him. He also found it was uh, he couldn't buy certain train tickets. Then he discovered he was unable to acquire a loan from any bank and even forbidden to buy property. Eventually, he discovered he was on a government list of dishonest persons subject to enforcement. And there was no obvious way to appeal the designation or have his name removed from the list. Hugh was one of the early victims of the Chinese social credit system, which blacklists citizens who are found to be, quote unquote, untrustworthy in the sole discretion of the Chinese government. So it tells a little story there. Then he transitions to the obvious where he says it's almost like an official version of Twitter of the Twitter mobs habit of canceling people for wrong think. And I don't know that it's almost like, I would say it's pretty much uh, identical. I, I don't know how it, other than uh, you're dealing with a government doing it with Twitter. It, in this case, it's a private company, which is, in my opinion, controlled, by, maybe not necessarily the government, but controlled to some degree to, of the, uh, by the central planners, at least, let's say, influenced heavily by the central planners. Maybe control is a little too strong of a word. Uh, so the Twitter mob may easily enough, to, uh, let's see, the Twitter mob may be easy enough to ignore for the most of us. For most of us, but now it's become more mainstream to purge U.S. residents who have bad social credit.
For example, PayPal has announced an inquisition in partnership with the Anti-Defamation League to research funding for its extremism on its payment platform. PayPal and ADL will focus on further uncovering and disrupting the financial pipelines that support extremist and quote unquote hate movements. And now a lot of you may be, you know, initially this sounds good. Like, oh, we will, do we want extremists? Do we want hate? But then you start to think through how they're defining this. And then you start thinking through how they are defining pretty much all words. You know, I would use the example of racism. Racism or a racist. If you say that word today, it has almost zero relationship to if you would have said that word in 1990. <laughs> and the, 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 the term racist in 1990, it really, it actually meant something, believe it or not. It meant what we all know it to mean. Today, it doesn't mean anything. It, it's like the word dude. It, it could mean just whatever you want it to mean, just uh, based on how you're using it in a sentence or the tone in which you're using it. If you say, dude, it could mean something far different than if you say, dude, it's the exact same thing now with racist. It, it has no meaning. <laughs> so that's, you get my point. What does extremist mean? I don't know. One man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. What does hate mean? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, we assume that it means hate like we would define it, but the crazies don't define it that way. They leave it very ambiguous. Well, it, it, hate is all a matter of how it, how your words make someone feel, I would assume, is what they would say. So how do you define that? How, how do you try to quantify that? How, how do you turn that into something that can be... Uh, uh, how do you turn that into something that can be a, a law? Well, unfortunately, I think we'll find out in the very near future. And here he goes on to reiterate exactly what I said. They are extremely vague about what they will consider extreme content. And we've just seen the goalposts for a lot of these words move all over the place in the last five years. So, uh, I mean, five years ago or 10 years ago, if you would have said that they'll, that this is you know in danger of how they define these words, most people would have been like, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's pretty straightforward what they're talking about. Now, I don't think really anyone would say that. I don't think even the people that are um, that are for the uh, th that are actually for uh, censoring, and I don't think the people that are would even be for this social credit score. I don't think they would even admit that. Okay, you're right. the 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 words are vague, but they're they should be vague. I mean, I, I don't think they would dispute that. I think they would just have some sort of bizarre counter argument. A new uh, so now he gives some examples. The New York Times, for example, considers the word freedom, quote unquote, to be an anti-government slogan according to a recent article on the protests in Cuba. Twitter considered it hate speech and banned a Spanish politician for tweeting, a man cannot get pregnant. That's probably one of the best examples. Because, again, even five or ten years ago, this, I mean, to even think that this could be offensive, saying a man cannot get pregnant, is Utterly ridiculous. And th there's really no way to articulate how insane that is. But yet today, as you all know, this is commonplace. Where 
just stating something that is so blatantly obvious can get you in trouble with the mob, so to speak. And saying something like this would definitely, definitely reduce your social credit score. And there's a lot of people out there that argue that it should. And that you should be given or not given a loan based on your social credit score. You should be banned from flying. Why shouldn't you be banned from flying? You're spreading hate. And these people truly believe that words can be construed as violence. So if your words are violence, then why would we allow a violent person on an airplane or a bus? Why would we allow a violent person that these people in the future will most likely consider a domestic terrorist? Why would we allow them to buy a car? Why would we allow them to have a bank account? You see, it, it's not a stretch to take this, I don't want to call it thinking, to take this line of feeling to its logical conclusion. Yeah, if you protest lockdowns, you are an extremist putting lives in danger. If you burn down police station and flip cars in the name of social justice, you are a most peaceful, mostly peaceful protester. And we see all of the big the big tech companies. In fact, we see all most companies right now towing this narrative or trying to push this narrative. And let's move on to another uh, article. I don't want to have you call it that from U.S. News here. And this is I, I don't even know what this is. I mean, th this is something out of a sci-fi movie, but unfortunately, it is real. Um. I, I guess it's a blog post. We'll call it a blog post. How to create a diverse and inclusive workforce. I want you to start really paying attention to the groups and individuals who are using the word diversity and inclusion or diverse and inclusive. And then start to focus on the people who are using those words over and over and over and over again and promoting these, again, I don't want to call them ideas because they're, they're, that's giving them too much credit, that are promoting these feelings. And, and, and just try to notice who these people are, who these groups are. And what you'll find is it's people who favor Marxism, central planning. It's the World Economic Forum. It's the IMF. It's the politi a lot of the politicians in the Western world. It's the banksters. It's all the corporate CEOs that have uh, drank the Klaus Kool-Aid, so to speak. They're the ones that are, are saying, so you got to think, okay, well, what, what's the objective here? And I think that even the, the politicians and the CEOs are, are useful idiots. And people like, uh, I don't know if it's this gal in the picture, or, or they're just, um, they're not even useful idiots. They're just tools of the useful idiots. And they truly have no idea not only what they're talking about, but I don't think it's possible for uh, someone to actually have experience in the real world outside of the academic world and and intellectual and if you're being intellectually honest, come to the conclusions that this is something that's actually beneficial to society. 
So the only thing that, it, that this is going to do is make society worse, not better. And then you've got to ask yourself, okay, well, who are these people that are uh, that are promoting these feelings and these words? And it's it's the global elite, it's the central planners, it's the people who truly, at the core of their belief system, see Marxism or a form of Marxism as a way to ach achieve this uh, socialist utopia. Now, whether their intentions are right or or true or just or malicious, I don't. I'll leave that up for you to decide. But let's go here. So we've got this uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. D E and I are often spoke of in the same breath. But when it comes to the workforce, each should be treated as its own distinct measure. Ay ay ay. Nefertiti Walker, PhD. How many uh, call centers do you think Nefertiti has uh, managed? M my guess is not a lot. Uh, how many businesses with over 10 employees has Nefertiti uh, started or run? How many times has, has Nefertiti um, risked her uh, life savings? to start a business that may or may not succeed. My guess is uh, very few times, if any at all. So these ideas sound great, but in practice, they, they don't work at all. And so what we to, to stay grounded, I think what we need to do is remember what wealth is in a society. And wealth has nothing to do with diversity. It has nothing to do with equity. It has nothing to do with inclusion. It has nothing to do with money. It has nothing to do with gold. It has nothing to do with Bitcoin. It has nothing to do with dollars. It has everything to do with how well or how efficiently the society can produce goods and services. Period. So anything that we're doing here, as far as trying to manhandle small and mid-sized business or corporations or the free market, we have to just ask ourselves if it is going to create an environment that can produce goods and services more efficiently in the future or less efficiently, because that's what it just boils down to. So we keep moving on here. My goodness gracious. Walker has developed her expertise by studying inclusion. See, <laughs> how can you develop expertise? in hiring and managing employees by studying um, I, I can it's a it's a rhetorical question you can't the way you develop expertise in dealing with employees in managing employees is by dealing and managing employees <laughs> You're not going to learn anything by studying it. Trust me. But anyway, she believes that she has become an expert by studying exclusion. Oh, okay. So she's she's trying to make herself an expert on inclusion by studying exclusion. To understand how to create more inclusive spaces, organizations, and cultures. See, again, why do we... Why do we want that? Why, why is that even an objective we should strive for? Like, why? Who cares? Like, like, like let's just think about this. Because you're you're not only manipulating the business, but you're what you're also doing is you're trying to manipulate the individuals who you are trying to help, or maybe you're not. 
Maybe there's malicious intent there. But what you, uh, whom you claim to help or who you claim to try to help, you're actually hurting those individuals. Let, let me give you an example here. Before I retired, uh, I had a, a business where I would deal with a lot of individuals in the uh, entertainment field. Okay. And in the entertainment business for, well, it's not for whatever reason. It's because people, women and gay dudes uh, tend to like the business. Great. Fantastic. So I dealt with a lot of gay dudes and a lot of women. Why? Because they were the ones that gravitated towards that industry and towards the business. But they won't they weren't coerced to be in that business. So there was a lot of uh, diversity, if you will, inclusion, uh, you know, all these buzzwords. There was a lot of diversity there. Actually, there wasn't much diversity because it was all women and gay dudes. <laughs> so there, there wasn't much diversity there at all. But I'm sure uh, that uh, Nefertiti would have, would have just loved it, would have just absolutely loved it for sure. Because uh, so, but my point there is that th the reason there are so many of those individuals in the business is because there's so many of those individuals who are interested in the vis the business. They wanted to be a part of the business. You see, now let's look at the world of, um, let's say, uh, oil drilling right? Or let's say when they're, uh, you know, what's that show on uh, Discovery Channel where they follow the, the, the fishermen in Alaska? It's like one of the most dangerous jobs in human history. Uh, so there's not a lot of women and gay dudes that are on fishing boats in Alaska. Well, why is that? Is is uh, Miss um, Nefertiti would say, well, that's obviously because the fishing boats in Alaska aren't focused on what they should be. They are not focused on diversity, and they are not focused on inclusion. No, 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 no. Because ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the people on a fishing boat in Alaska are white dudes. <laughs> There's no diversity there whatsoever. But let's just say that the government in, uh, in Nefertiti made it mandatory for every business to have a certain percentage of uh, women, a certain percentage of gays, a certain percentage of uh, Asians, blacks, whites, reds, purples, greens, whatever, right? Who would you be doing a disservice to? You'd be, dis you'd be, you'd, you would force people that really didn't want to be in that line of work to pursue those activities. Or and, and even if you didn't force them to do it, you would be promoting that instead of just letting people decide where they want to work. How about that? How about we just let individuals decide what industry they want to work in? And then why don't we just let the cream rise to the top? So I don't care if you're this color, that color. I don't care what sex you are. I don't care what your hair looks like. I don't care. Nothing matters to me at all except one thing. How good are you at your job? That's it. And you see, since Nefertiti has never been in the real world, she believes that all human beings are just a monolith. They're all homogenous. In other words, that all human beings have the exact same skill sets. The exact same. There's no difference between Jim and Sally and Bob and Bill. There's no difference at all. 
one person isn't a harder worker than the other. The other person isn't more intelligent. The other person isn't better at sales. We're all identical. We're all the exact same. And therefore, if we're all the exact same, like these inanimate blocks of wood that you can just move around at, at will, then why shouldn't we have a diverse? Why shouldn't we focus the attention on diversity, equity, and inclusion? But unfortunately, what Nefertiti doesn't understand is we are not the same. People have wildly different skill sets and wildly different interests. It's been that way throughout human history, and it'll continue to be that way forever. As long as we exist as human beings on this planet, we will have different skill sets and we will have different interests. <laughs> it's just the way it is, right? So what we're doing by selecting employees for specific jobs in specific industries based strictly on the color of their skin or their anatomy or their preference what what we're doing their, their sexual preference what i meant uh, what we're doing there is we are creating an environment where not only will people be less happy but it's far less efficient and produces far fewer goods and services therefore you guys know where i'm going with this if we produce fewer goods and services we are becoming less wealthy we are becoming poorer our standard of living is decreasing and that's the the, the bottom line that's what's going to happen as america and the western world pursues these insane policies that are being pushed by the global elite, the woke crowd, if you will. But again, it goes back to the the Davos crowd, you know, that we talk about all the time. That that what you're going to get is you're going to get a poor society, and you're going to get a society of people who are less happy. And you know what? What's interesting here, and it, you, you see this just repeated over and over and over again. Oh, I love this part. Yeah, I had to highlight that. So she wants us to. Uh, I got to read this before companies begin crafting a, str a strategic plan to address diversity. So why? Why do we need a specific plan? Why don't we just hire people who are best for the job? And so the pushback to that is going to be, oh well, they're not going <laughs> to. No business is going to hire people just based on how well they perform. Come on. No, 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 no. It's just a, a good old boys club where they're just going to hire whoever they want to hire, whoever they like hanging out with. Listen, if you think that, you've never started your own business, period. And and that, and the little, uh, you know, solopreneur with three employees, virtual assistants in Philippines, that doesn't count. That's not a business. <laughs> That's a side hustle. That's a hobby. That's not a business. When you start a business and you grow at 50 employees, 100 employees, you've got your life savings on the line. You've got your children's future on the line. You have the ability to put a roof over your head, to put food on the table. When you've got that on the line, trust me, you do not care what someone looks like. You do, not, you do not care the color of their skin. You don't care about their sexual preference. You care about one thing and one thing only. How much money can this person make me? How good is this person at their job? That's all you care about. And what's ironic here is people like Nefertiti always uh, claim that these entrepreneurs and these business owners are greedy, just gr insatiably greedy. They're just, and we've got to use the government to curtail that greed because it just left unchecked, they're going to they're gonna completely destroy society because of that greed that just can never be satisfied. But think that one through. If the employee, or excuse me, if the employer is that greedy, won't that prompt them to hire the person that can make them the most money?
You see, those two thoughts can't coexist <laughs> in a rational person's mind. Either the employer is insatiably greedy or they choose employees based on something other than merit. You can't have it both ways. It's either or. So if the employer is choosing people based on something other than merit, well, they're not that greedy. They're not concerned about the bottom line. And if the employer is insatiably greedy, then the only thing they care about is merit because the only thing they care about is the bottom line. But so let, let me keep going here. It's very easy for an organization to come out and say that we need to be more diverse. But I think what we really have to understand is what do they look like internally? So Walker says, how do people really feel in the organization? You notice feelings, diversity, inclusion. What, what? Go back and read Marx. Uh, read it for heaven's sakes. <laughs> this is all this straight Marxism. And with, with it's, it's straight Marxism with a sprinkling of propaganda, maybe more than a sprinkling. Remember, how did the Germans prior to th that, the German group we all know about, prior to World War II, how did they really convince people to believe things that were insane? Well, first and foremost, I've talked about this over and over and over again. Most of you guys know what I'm going to say. First and foremost, they got people to abandon critical thinking and replace it with feeling. The only priority was your feelings. Forget that critical thinking thing. At the end of the day, that doesn't matter because we're all emotional human beings. So the only thing that matters is how we feel. It's the exact same message this group of Germans used prior to World War II. And it's the exact same message that they are reiterating. They, the global elite, the useful idiots, and the pawns of the useful idiots are just regurgitating over and over and over again. It's the same stuff. Or it's the exact same delivery mechanism. So I'm, let's see, what does she say here? Oh, this is a whole class you can take. Oh my gosh, would, wouldn't that be enlightening? Wow. In Intro to Diversity and Inclusion, we develop techniques aimed at allyship and inclusive leadership. Our students need to be able to practice and apply these concepts in the classroom through case study work so that they can then go and apply them in real life. Okay, so again, let's just say that all these students learn this. They learn to abandon meritocracy. They learn to abandon merit and, ex and focus exclusively on diversity and inclusion when they start their own business. Number one, they'll fail. <laughs> miserably but number two does that create a society that is producing more or less stuff because i can promise you that all of the competitors in china i can promise you that none of them are focusing on diversity and inclusion so if every single business here in the United States is, that means they have a competitive edge. It's just the way it works. And then I guess she goes on to say how this is possible. You know, you get it. And so why am I going over this article in addition to the email from Simon Black, SovereignMan.com? Because I think that this is going to dovetail into the social credit score that we were talking about earlier. 
this is going to be one way in which they measure your social credit score or your social credit score as a business. It's going to be based on diversity, inclusion, and it's going to be based on some sort of uh, green score, you know, for climate change, uh, some sort of ESG score that's going to be created by the central planners themselves. And I would argue, and you may say, well, George, that's a good thing. We should be worried about the climate. Okay, that's fine. But I'm saying that the central planners have no concern about the future of the planet. They don't have any, in my opinion, they don't have much concern about climate change. They don't have much concern about diversity or inclusion. What they have concern with is gaining more power. And if they're the ones that are giving out the uh, carbon credits, as an example, then they're the ones that are controlling business. They're the ones that are controlling the means of production. Exactly like the German group did with the economy, the German economy, prior to World War II. They didn't own the means of production. They just controlled it. And the central planners, in my opinion, are trying to do the exact same thing today through ESG and through this drivel nonsense of diversity and inclusion. And if you don't believe me, just go to the uh, uh, World Economic Forum's website and just type in diversity and inclusion. See how often Klaus talks about diversity and inclusion. Nonstop. <laughs> Nonstop. He talks about it as almost as much as he criticizes Milton Friedman. So this, in my opinion, and, and I hope I am wrong, and, and a, again, uh, as Hayek says, just because you're on the road to serfdom doesn't mean that you can't get off. But I, I think that there's a probability that we are headed in this direction. And I, I think as a, a, a rebel capitalist, we you should realize that at the end of the day, um, you know, building wealth is is great, and that's a, a good objective. And that, that, but why are you doing it? You're, you're the only reason you want to gain wealth or build wealth, grow your wealth, is to increase your level of freedom, because money doesn't buy you happiness, but it does buy you freedom. But without the freedom. The wealth doesn't matter. So our my point is our first priority should be freedom and liberty. And that should be above growing wealth. Because again, without the personal freedom and liberty, the wealth doesn't matter. If you could have you could be a billionaire, but if you're locked up in a cage. If you're stuck in Venezuela, all those billions of dollars don't matter at all. And so I, I think this is just another thing that we need to be cognizant of. Uh, and I, we've, I, I mean, the way I look at it is I, I have all these buckets, right? I've got my personal freedom and liberty bucket. I've got my building wealth bucket. I've got my investing bucket. I've got my macroeconomic bucket where I'm trying to think through, um, you know, possible outcomes with inflation, deflation, the dollar, et cetera, uh, commodities. But in, in my um, personal freedom and liberty bucket, this is something that I am really paying attention to. And I think it's something that you should pay attention to as well. Okay, guys, let me do some shout outs here. We've got VK Travel Log, Chris Palmer, Casper, HXR, The Future Capitalist. Hmm, very cool. Bloodbath McGrath. 
We got Matt Silva, you are the creator, Wormwood, Ann Cooper, Wayne Smith, Alan Zibelman, Daniel Barnett, Standing Mannequin, Dwayne Hunt, 700 and, or 1776, Reasons Why, Malaysia, Numismatic, <laughs> Kyle Tompkins, Tao, Tao. Annette Walls, Kimba, the White Lion, Terry Williman, hashtag in the Fed. All right, guys, enjoy the rest of your afternoon, and I'll see you on the next video.